Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 46. So there was some terrorist attacks occasionally, especially in the capital, and they were targeting like people working for the government. And, and so if you worked, for example, at a university, you were a target. So my, both my parents were university teachers. My name is Alina Warwick, and today we have Amin Rahal on the show. I'm super excited to chat with Amin because he's the author of the book called Immigrant Hustle. For those of you guys who haven't picked up the book, the book is absolutely amazing. Amin featured 50 immigrant entrepreneurs and their stories to entrepreneurship. So Amin immigrated from Algeria, North Africa, with his family when he was 12 years old, but his family immigrated to Canada. So in this episode, we talk about what the Canadians immigration process is like, what his journey was like to writing his book and what his journey was like to entrepreneurship. I mean, never imagined that he was going to become an entrepreneur. After being fired from his job, he left his country in Canada and went to New York for a new job. That is when his eyes were opened and he realized that he did not want to be an employee anymore. So let's dive right in and hear all about his journey. Okay, Amin, thank you so much for joining me on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. And I'm super excited to talk all about your journey because you've immigrated to Canada. So you're a very special guest on my show. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So let's talk about your immigrant journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to Canada? Yes, I'm from North Africa. So I was born in Algeria. My family moved to Canada. I was 12 years old, so I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, they moved for the same reason as many other families move, uh, mostly looking for more opportunities for for the kids. You know, my parents had good jobs in North Africa, so they didn't really do it for them. It was mostly to give us kids, me and my brother, you know, more opportunities. And it's, uh, basically, similar reasons uh, as many other families that moved to Canada, mm-hmm. the U.S. or Europe, right? And so what was it like growing up in Algeria? Um, you know, it was a very simple life. We had everything. We really didn't need much. We didn't have like the internet and, and uh, iPads and, and uh, all the technology we have today. We kind of just played in the streets with our neighbors. And But I mean, we had all the basics. We had all the, you know, we had food, we had shelter, we had everything that we needed. My parents, like I said, had good jobs. So um, for a kid, I guess it's kind of hard to understand at that age why the family's moving, but, you know, I was still at the age where I, where I understood, you know, there was a lot of security concerns as well back then. The country was struggling with some terrorist attacks and, and things like that. So it wasn't just about opportunities. It was also about security and, 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 you know, freedom to be able to be walking alone at night at whatever time at night, you know, without risking your life, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah. Did so you- it was, it was a peaceful, well, peaceful. I mean, it was, it was a good life for a kid. Like I said, because you do get, when you don't have technology, you kind of have to socialize with other kids. Yeah. So I, like today, I see the advantages of that kind of life. Back then, you know, obviously every kid, they always want like the latest gadgets and toys and, and gaming consoles and stuff. But today, you know, as I got older, I do see the benefit in that kind of life that you no longer find today. Even in, you know, and even in poor countries now, kids have access to all this technology. So um it's sad that kind of life that I had as a kid no longer exists. Children no yeah. longer really have, have access to it today. Yeah, yeah. So did you say you lived through a period of war? Well, it was kind of like like a, like a civil war kind of, you know. Okay. It was like an extremist, you know, those people that were extremists and like Islamist kind of. Activist. Yeah, kind of like that. So there was some terrorist attacks occasionally, especially in the capital. And they were targeting like people working for the government and And so if you worked, for example, at a university, you were a target. So my, both my parents were university teachers because yeah, when you work for university, you basically work for the government, you know, in those countries, universities are not private institutions like, like in, uh, in the US or Canada, they're part of the governments. Yeah. So there was that security risk. So why did your parents decide Canada and not United States or another country? Do they have family or friends out here? Any connections? Well, it was mostly for the French language. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so the east part of Canada, obviously in Quebec, you know, you can, uh, it's, it's a bilingual uh, province, so you can 
work in French or English, um, mm -hmm. but it's mostly French in Quebec. Actually, French is the first language. Oh. Yeah, English is second. So mm -hmm. um, that was the main reason, you know. And also, my dad had done his PhD in Montreal, so he, he already knew the city, and he had some some he knew some people uh, in Montreal. It just seemed like a logical next move mm -hmm. for the family. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And did your parents find jobs right away when they immigrated? No, it was a struggle, especially for my dad, who was a chemistry teacher back home. It wasn't really easy to find a job as a chemistry teacher. There wasn't really high demand at the time. So he had to do all sorts of odd jobs, you know, all types of minimum wage jobs. And he would occasionally find like a small contract position at a university or college as a chemistry professor. And so he took advantage of all those little contracts he could find. And eventually, I think after 10 years, he was able to find like a permanent position of a chemistry, you know, for being like mm -hmm. a chemistry professor um, at a college. But yeah, for 10 years, it was a struggle. Um, it was like just little jobs here and there, little contracts that would last like a semester. And then he had to find something else. So it was rough for him. For my mom, she went back to school because her diplomas, her degrees, she had a master's degree back home, but that wasn't really recognized. So she kind of had to go back to school. I think she got like a bachelor's degree or something like that. I'm not, I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. But yeah, after that, she got a job at a bank and she worked for a few years, but then she didn't really like it. So she tried different things, but eventually she found she found a job she liked. But uh, it was mostly for my dad that it was really difficult because he just didn't expect that, right? He just mm -hmm. he was just so comfortable back in, in North Africa. He had, a, he had a really good job, so he wasn't ready for that. I think for him it was the it was more difficult. My mom was just ready to do anything, right? When when we were yeah. there, <laughs> yeah, because she she was she was even the one pushing for for immigration for years, and my dad never wanted to. He's you know he kept saying, "Hey, we're good here. We have a good life. We both have mm -hmm. jobs." get to travel you know we, we were traveling we were going to europe every summer you know we had two cars we had basically all everything we needed for you know and everything that a middle class family would have here yeah. we already had it back there right mm -hmm. so my dad kind of saw all the risks especially since he was in his early 50s you know and he had he was also like thinking of retirement right like as with any immigrants like you move to a new country in your 50s you kind of have to start from scratch and you only have about 15 years of work left. So, you yeah. know, that kind of, you kind of jeopardize your, the comfort of your require of your uh, retirement. Yeah. So he didn't want to move for years. And so my mom, and you know, he kept saying, Hey, we're taking, a, you know, this is like taking a big risk. We're leaving everything we've built here. And my mom, like, she never really cared about that because she said, Hey, I don't mind starting from scratch. I don't mind doing minimum wage jobs. I wouldn't even mind cleaning people's bathrooms. That's how badly she wanted to move. Wow. So that's why for her, it wasn't really difficult. You know, she was happy every day being in, yeah. in Canada. For him, it was more difficult. So. so does Canada provide any government assistance? I know in America, we have like welfare and food stamps to help the immigration process out a little bit in the beginning stages. Does Canada have something like that too? Yeah, they do. I mean, there's, it's very similar. You have access to all these uh, different programs. Did you guys take any of those government assistance No. No. No, we never did. And that was one thing that my parents never wanted to. They always said, hey, for as long as we're healthy, we can work. We can find work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they never really wanted to uh, to even think about that as an option. Kept trying to get uh, whatever job they could get, especially in the beginning. But yeah, that was never really an option for them. Got it. Got it. And so um, at 12 years old, I don't know if you remember, but what was the immigration process like for your parents? Do you remember at all, because I know in America, it's pretty long and inundated process. So <laughs> I want to hear what is the process like in Canada? So what do you mean by integration process? So to get fully citizenship, like your citizenship to like complete residency uh -huh. to Canada. So it's not as complicated as the U.S. So I think the process only takes like three years or maybe five years. I think it was three years back then. Maybe now it's five. Okay. But when you're an accepted immigrant, so basically it depends what status uh, they give you, right? If obviously, if you come in as a refugee, it's way more complicated. But when you're an accepted immigrant, they accepted you because they feel like you have the professional qualifications to find work and eventually become a citizen. So it's a little bit easier than, as I said, like if you're a refugee or there's different statuses um, that you can get. But yeah, so it took, I think, three years to get citizenship mm -hmm. or maybe five. To be honest, I don't really remember. Three or yeah, five. 
But, it's okay. Um, yeah, I know. I know the U.S. is like ten, right, or something like that. It, you know, it really depends. I hear, you know, from a couple of years to ten years, and sometimes people even give up and then they go to Canada and live <laughs> there <laughs> because Canada is a lot easier process. That's why I wanted to to see what the immigration process is like in Canada because America needs to follow their processes. <laughs> yeah, because it also depends if you got like invited from a company, like right, if you come in on a business type of invitation status status or visa, right? Like got it. Because mm-hmm. right now, for example, right now for my company, I'm hiring someone that's based in the UAE because I need someone that speaks Arabic and that has experience with that market because we're trying to expand to that market. And so because I sent them a business invitation through my company, I think the process is like six months or something like that from what they told me. They already did the interview at the embassy and, and the medical checkup and, and all this all this stuff that took us years to do. It was done within six months just because they have a business invitation. If you have a certain amount you want to invest in real estate, like 100000 or something, I mean, I'm not sure about the exact amount, but I think it's way easier also, right? Because then you qualify for a different type of visa because you're like seen as an investor. And the amount is not, is not that high. I know in the US, I think it's much, much higher, maybe like half a million or a million, but I think in Canada, it's much lower than that. So when you guys immigrated, you guys all spoke French, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then how did you pick up English? You don't even have an an accent. I mean, I do have a little bit of an accent, I think, but uh, <laughs> maybe hard to perceive because I've, um, you know, I've, I lived in the US, I lived in China. And in China, you basically speak English. You learn Chinese on the side, but you speak English with other people. And uh, yeah, I lived in the US and now I'm in Toronto. So my, my partner, my girlfriend is Anglophone. She doesn't speak French. So yeah, all these uh, factors basically <laughs> kind it. of forced you to pick it up real quick. No, yeah. but I mean, we, we you speak the basics, like, you know, even at 12, you kind of learn English at school as a second language. So I'd say that I was like, I spoke basic English even as a teenager. And then at 18, 19, 20, that's when I really started to really learn much faster and practice more often. Yeah. And then when you start traveling, then it's, then it's game over. You, you kind of have to... <laughs> To learn fast because that, that's the international language, right? Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, before you tell our listeners about your company, tell me a little bit about the path you took. And I want to know if you tried to go into any other fields before starting your business. So the, the, the short answer is no, I never tried any other field because I knew, I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be involved in computer science. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, I think at six years old, because my mom was a computer science teacher. No way. Algeria, yeah. Yeah, so we had a computer at home. I was six years old. Yeah, and it's funny because when we came to Canada, a lot of my, a lot of kids didn't have a computer and I already had one back in North Africa. A lot of them didn't believe it. They said, hey, how, how's that even possible? They thought like everyone there was just living, had a camel and, <laughs> and you know, the whole place was a, it was a giant, you know, Sahara desert. desert. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, the, the city was very developed at the time. Yeah, a lot of people that worked in universities, they had access to uh, all this technology. And so, yeah, we had, uh, we had a computer at home. So I was playing video games at six years old. And yeah, that's when I really fell in love with the field. And I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be involved in this field. I just didn't know that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just knew I wanted to be working with computers but entrepreneurship was not even on the radar. There was no entrepreneur around me. Well, I mean, there were, but, you know, they weren't really successful. You know, they were just kind of hustling and trying. But the people that had like, that had like a comfortable life, they all had advanced university degrees. Mm-hmm. So that was the model that I had. Just like a lot of immigrants, we kind of think that going to university is, is de facto path to success, right? It's, right. There's right. no other option. Especially people my age that grew up in the 80s and 90s. Today, mm-hmm. it's different, obviously. Uh, there's so many examples of entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs out there, and they're given a, a lot more um, coverage and on TV and radio and media in general. So did you end up going to college? So I went, but I only, I lasted for like a month. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not for everyone. No, you're totally right. <laughs> yeah. So basically I went to like a technical school and I got like a programming degree. Like I learned how to program, how okay. to code. And that was more than enough for me, right? Those, uh, those couple of years I spent in that technical school, I learned everything I needed to basically get a job. 
Oh, got it. So you went to like a community college or a technical college and then, but you didn't go to a university to get like a bachelor's degree or a master's no, degree. No, Okay, got actually. it. But you know what? It seems like the software field, even back, well, I don't know back then, but even nowadays, the software field, the IT field, they don't really require a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. So I hear a lot about like these certifications and experience and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're, it, totally, you're totally right. It's funny because now I hire programmers for my company occasionally. And when I look at their resume, really the first thing that I look at is experience and portfolio. Like I want to see what they produced rather than any paper that they have from education. Like that's the last thing I care about is education. Actually, the you know, I hired about uh, five programmers in the last few years, the last five years. And the most skilled out of all those five programmers was a guy that only has a high school degree. So he learned everything on his own. And I hired him and he was even surprised. He said, hey, I never thought I'd be given a chance. I'd be given even an interview given that I only have a high school degree. But the thing is, he produced a lot of web applications on his own for fun. And he showed me that in when he applied in the cover letter. And I thought that was fantastic. That shows passion. That shows, you know, dedication. That shows like incredible skill to be able to code all these uh, applications without going to school. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Why would they hire someone that has a bachelor's or a master's degree, but has absolutely nothing, that has done nothing in in practice? It's just all theory. Yeah. They never coded anything. The self-taught people are complete geniuses. (laughs) Yeah. And in this field, you find a lot of them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the path that you you lived in New York and then you lived in China. What was all that about? Did you just tell your parents one day I'm going to move to New York City and just hang out there for a little bit and then you woke up one day and decided to go to China? What was that journey like? It's it's funny because there's a lot of um, I don't know, I feel like I there's a lot of fate in this whole thing. Like there's a lot of things that you don't really control, like events that kind of happen and lead you in specific directions because I never really planned for all of this to happen. So I had a good job. When I graduated from that technical college, I got a really good job from my age. I was in my early 20s and I was working as a programmer for this big oil and gas company and things were going really well. So I was programming, working on this application that was like a electronic library. And anyways, the, the, the whole experience was fantastic. And I was really happy working there and my, you know, I had great relationship with my, uh, my colleagues, and my boss and everyone. But one day when I didn't see this happen at all, I got fired. So it was mm-hmm. like a new boss that came in that replaced my old boss. And this new lady didn't really like the way things were and she wanted to change a few things. And so, yeah, so she, you know, she came to my office and she called me to her, to her office and she presented me with that letter saying that, hey, starting today, you're, you're no longer an employee and so you have to pack your bags and, and, and go. Wow. So that day, in hindsight, that was the best day ever because if, had I not gotten fired that day, I think I would still be at that company. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'd, I would still be working there because I had really no reason to uh, to do anything else. I was very comfortable, had a good salary. And um, all my colleagues back then are still there today. No one really left. <laughs> wow. So that's the, the danger of, of being in a comfortable nine to five is that oftentimes you really need like a major kick in, in the butt if you want your career path to change. So that was the, that's why I said it's kind of fate because I, I really didn't, didn't expect that to happen. And I didn't really expect to move to New York or China was even, it was not even, you know, remotely uh, in the Anything plan. Anything in your plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So yeah, when that happened, I kind of got depressed for a bit and I didn't really want to do anything. And yeah, I think one day my dad actually was the one that recommended that I try to uh, travel, he try to get a job in another country. And I thought that was a great idea, but I just thought that I had no chance given that I didn't really have a, an advanced college degree. I always thought that if you really want to uh, get a job in another country, you kind of need like a, a solid resume. I only had like two years of experience and, you know, a technical degree, uh, not degree, mm-hmm. but diploma. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know what, it's a good idea. I'll try, but I really don't think it's going to lead to much. And so I basically started res- sending resumes to a bunch of places that I wanted to go to. So I sent resumes to places in Europe, Latin America, and in New York. I think in New York, in the US, New York was really the only place that I wanted to um, to work in. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I got a few calls and New York was one of them. And I did a few interviews and 
you know, I ended up uh, getting an offer to go um, work in New York City. So it was for UNICEF, UN uh, Charity uh, for Children. Uh, and what did you do there? What was your job? So it was uh, to be a web developer. So it was a logical continuation of what I was doing in Montreal. So yeah, great experience and stayed there for a couple of years. But I think that was... But you hated it. Well, it's not that I hated it. It's just <laughs> that I... <laughs> it, was, it was a great experience, but I just realized that I wanted to start something on my own. I think that's, that was the moment where, um, I don't know, I caught the bug, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial bug, right? Like I just felt like I was ready to... Um, to start my own company. And I and, was and why? Sorry, sorry, I mean to interrupt. Um, and why, why at that specific job, you caught the entrepreneur job? Was there something that was like completely annoying you every single time you went into work or you just thought that, you know, this cubicle life is not for me? Yeah, so two reasons. Um, so the first reason is I, I already had kind of like a side hustle. I was already developing websites for other people and companies on the side, so on my free time, right? Got it. Okay. Evenings and weekends, like people knew, hey, you need a website, go ask a mean, you know, people in the family, friends, everyone, right? So I was already doing that and I could see that this could turn into a business at the time, right? I just, mm. it, you know, I just realized that I didn't have enough time to take on all this business and I was working way too much on weekends and evenings sometimes doing these side projects. And I just could see that if I did this full time, it would be a, it would be a great business. And also because in my day job, I just realized that I wasn't really learning as much. It was mostly like I was working on old technology. You know, the thing is the UN, just like any other government, it's a little bit like you work on outdated software, like everything is slow there, right? Like yeah, yeah. Any times, anytime you want to do something, there's multiple levels of approval Yes, and it can take months or years to get done. So everything was slow. We, we, we were, you know, half of my week was just sitting in meetings that <laughs> I had nothing to do. Like, yeah, meetings that really didn't concern me whatsoever. It's yeah. almost as if they just wanted an audience for whoever was speaking. <laughs> so they would invite everyone on the floor. Hey, there's a meeting, you know, come, come attend. And they were mandatory. If you would skip a meeting, you'd get shit from your boss. <laughs> so I hated that part. I was like, why am I sitting in these meetings? You know, and then you go back to your cubicle and you kind of do the same thing. You work on this old outdated software that everybody hates and it's full of bugs, but they've been planning to change it for years. And it's in, it's still in planning stages and it's, there's still many people that need to review it. And everything is just so slow. And I just, to be honest, like if, if I had kids, let's say I had kids and I was maybe, you know, at a certain age, in a certain age bracket where I really needed that job security, I think I would have stayed there. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it was just too good of a job in terms of job security and uh, benefits. And also like, it's the best in the world. Like when you work for the government or for the UN, it doesn't get any better than that in terms of benefits. Right. Mm -hmm. But given that I was in my twenties, it didn't really matter to me to have all those benefits and because I didn't have kids, I didn't have family, I didn't really have that many financial obligations. So so I didn't mind leaving all the security mm -hmm. behind and kind of taking the risk to be an entrepreneur. Got yeah. it, got it. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. And okay, and so what led you to China? Yeah, so after New York, my girlfriend at the time, she had planned or she was planning to teach English in Asia right? She, she had always wanted to have that experience. A lot of her friends had done it. And so um, it was something she wanted to do. And I love traveling. So for me, it was, uh, I have nothing planned. I just left this job and I can work remotely on these uh, side projects that I have. So Oh, but you quit UN. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I quit. Yeah. This wasn't part of the job to travel to China. It was, uh, okay. <laughs> I quit my day job and then I went with her. So she, she applied to a bunch of jobs in Asia and she got an offer in China. And so I went with her and I ended up finding a job as well myself there, but I only lasted for a few months. Uh, I didn't really like the job there. And so I would say that in China is where I officially became a full-time entrepreneur. So you kept your web designing business, your side hustle to full time in China. Exactly. In China. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. Awesome. And so how old were you when you did that full time in China? 27. Yeah. 27 years old. So then how long did you guys last in China and what was next for you? Yeah, we stayed for about a year and three months. 
Okay. Well, it was mostly my girlfriend that wanted to, to come back to North America. I could have stayed a little bit longer because I wanted to travel a little bit more in Asia, on, uh, around Asia. But she, uh, she wanted to come back because she wanted to go back to university. So we went back to New York. We stayed in New York for a bit and then we went back to Canada. Yeah, that's what happened. So is Iron Mong Solutions what you started doing full time in China? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you've been doing this ever since? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about your company, what you guys do, what you guys focus on. Yeah, so when we started, well, when I started, because it was yeah. a, solo, a solo game at the time, <laughs> uh, it was really just designing websites. That's what I was doing. It was just you know mostly simple websites for small businesses or self-employed entrepreneurs. My first ever job was for a photographer. Like when I say first, meaning a job that's not a friend or a family member or someone that came through through my direct uh, network. Yeah. So it was like simple websites, you know, mostly front end, HTML, CSS, that kind of stuff. And over the years, I added, I started adding a little bit more services uh, around around web design. So like web marketing, search engine, opti- search engine optimization, uh, search engine marketing, social media, you know, conversion optimization, basically everything you'd expect from a digital marketing company. And how did you grow into that? Did you start picking up books and learning stuff on your own and said, this is the next thing and I got to help everyone out from web designing to, you know, like a one-stop shop digital marketing? Yeah, so in the beginning, it was just, um, I was just learning everything on my own uh, because I needed to market my own company, right? I needed to learn how to use Google Ads, how to optimize my own website for search results, how to start up my own social media presence, you know, how to do email marketing, write newsletters, all that stuff. I was learning it on my own because I didn't really have any other choice. I was in China at the time, so I didn't really have access to, uh, to anything. It's not like I could go to a school to learn it. Like I wasn't even in a big city. I was in a small city. I wasn't in Shanghai <laughs> or Beijing. <laughs> where you could probably find English schools if you want to learn something. You know, I was in a small town, so um, I had to learn everything online. So how did yeah. you learn online? Did you do online courses or just watch what people did? How did you do that? So it's just reading articles, uh, being part of online forums, following the leaders in the space. You know, it's it, that's the most beautiful part of the internet. You know, you can find the most successful people in any space that you're involved in and you can just follow them and and read their material, read their content. To me, that's the best way to learn. So that's what I was doing at the time. I knew who were the top people in my field and I was following them. I was attending whatever online conferences or, or, or talks that they were involved with and yeah, reading their blog posts and also learning from just trying everything myself. And that's that's something that I'm a big fan of is just getting your hands dirty, right? You know, you read about something, just try it with a live website. You know, you have nothing to lose. Uh, you know, if you fail, you learn something when you fail, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just trying a bunch of different things with my own you know, my own site, uh, my own websites. And yeah, eventually I developed enough, you know, enough of a skill set, enough knowledge to be able to offer these services to other clients that wanted to achieve the same thing. And a lot of clients would call the company and say, hey, I found you on Google on the first page. So can you help me get on the first page as well? They basically, yeah, the the thing sells itself. Like if you're already doing it for yourself, then you know how to do it, right? So, so, and then did you market yourself using like Facebook ads, Google ads in the beginning stages or or people kind of just found you and started asking you for help? Uh, that's that's exactly what I did. I started marketing my own website through all these different channels, social media, Google. And one thing that I did that was a game changer and I recommend every entrepreneur do it when they start is working for free to build a portfolio and to get some reviews and testimonials. That's literally the most important thing you can do when you start because no one trusts you if you don't have anything to show, right? So I basically built about 10 websites, you know, and helped 10 different companies with their online marketing for free or for very little money, basically just the basic to cover my own costs, just to get the testimonial from them. And, um, you know, to be able to show any prospect, hey, look, these guys are, are happy customers. Look what I've done for them. Then no one knows if they paid you or not, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Exactly. Nobody knows, and, yeah. 
And so how did you, how did you generate the revenue when you were taking these free clients? Did you have something on the side that kept yeah, on well, generating like monthly revenue? Yeah, so it's money saved from my other jobs, right? And and the beauty about being in China is that the cost of living is very low. So <laughs> yeah. whatever. And that's that's something that honestly, like I tell people, like if you're if you're on a on a on a really low budget and you can do your work online, like hundred percent online, like you know, you could be an accountant, you could be a coach, whatever you are. There's a lot of jobs that you could do just online, right? You don't need an office. Like I say, move to a country where the cost of living is much lower because Right there, like right there and then, you're going to be able to spend a lot more, invest, like invest a lot more in your business. And a lot of them are doing it right now. There's the whole movement of digital nomads, a lot of people moving to Indonesia, to Mexico, to Portugal, to all these places where the cost of living is way cheaper than the US or Canada or the UK. And you can do your job remotely and your rent is 10 times lower. So yeah, we're in China. Our rent was $250 a month. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, for like a beautiful apartment right by the lake in one of the most beautiful parts of town. It was like like a postcard. You look out of our window and it's literally a postcard and $250 a month. Wow. You don't don't need much money to live for to cover your basics in those countries. So I saved a little bit of money, not even that much from my job in New York. And I was able to live uh, for a long time just with those savings. That's amazing. And so thank you so much for sharing that powerful tool. (laughs) Mm, I love it. Um, I mean, who are your major clients right now? Are these small businesses, medium-sized businesses? Who do you guys normally serve? It's small and medium. So it used to be just small businesses, so like under a million dollar in revenue. Okay. But now we have a lot more medium size that are, you know, between one and five million in revenue. Right. But yeah, no, no, no big corporation or governments or anything like that. Those are a whole different, whole different market that we don't really specialize in. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. And so I do want to switch gears a little bit and we'll come back to Iron Monk Solutions. I want to talk about your book, Immigrant Hustle. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. And what made you decide to write a book that outlines the amazing immigrant entrepreneur's journeys? Yeah. So there's uh, several reasons. I'd say the number one reason is that I wanted the book that I that was for the uh, 18 year old me um, that I wish I had at the time. So basically, my parents really didn't like the idea that I didn't want to go to college, right? And I was working at this company, and even though I had a job, I was a programmer. I was in my early 20s. My parents were still kind of gently pushing me to kind of go to university and get uh, get a bachelor's and maybe a master's and, and something like that. So they, they still felt like, even though I had that job, they felt like I'd be limited in terms of what I could achieve in terms of like being promoted. You know, they kept saying, if you want to become like upper management at that company or whatever, you do need to have a university degree. And they kind of were right because when I was looking at all the, the managers and VPs and, and stuff, they all had at least a bachelor's. But that wasn't really what I wanted to, I, was, I wasn't aiming for that. So I, I think at that time, I was already thinking that I could potentially open my business once I have enough experience. As I said, even back then, I was still doing these little side hustles, uh, doing these little websites on the side. Yeah, so I wish I had that book to see that, hey, look at all these people that were able to create a successful, um, comfortable life for themselves by pursuing entrepreneurship and pursuing their passion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the first reason. It really, it was, it was like a selfish book that I wish I had so I can show my yeah. parents, look, here's the reason why I don't need to go to college. Got all these people, most of them don't have a college degree. Right. Did your parents read the book? Well, so my dad has passed away. So unfortunately, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wish I wish he had a chance to uh, to look at Aww. it. But uh, yeah, my mom loves it. She loves the concept, and she now totally understands it. And, yeah, <laughs> and totally sees that it's definitely like not just an alternative. It's actually oftentimes a better path for a lot of people, especially those that know exactly what they want to do and that can learn without going to college. Because what's the point of getting like six figure debt going to college when you can learn stuff today with all these millions of websites? that offer classes or even on YouTube, it's free, right? You want to learn right. coding, it's right there. Anyways, so that was the first reason for making the book. The second reason is that, so when I moved to New York, you know, I was meeting a lot of immigrants, especially when you take taxis in New York, you get to meet a lot of these cab drivers that basically ended up driving a cab because they couldn't find a job that matched whatever qualifications they had in their home country. 
right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, you talk to them, you know, they say, you know, I've been applying to tons of, of job offers and never got called back. You know, I was a uh, an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer in my home country. And here I can't, you know, I can't even get like a paralegal or a legal assistant job. Or So oftentimes I would ask them, like, what about just working for yourself? What about just being an entrepreneur? You could be your own lawyer. You could be your own engineer, you know, create your own products, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, a lot of them would, would respond saying, well, I don't have a business degree or I don't have connections or I don't have the money. Like all these reasons that to me, don't really make any sense because you don't really need any of that. But to them, these were valid reasons for not starting a business, not because they didn't want to, but because they thought it was so complicated because you need all these things. So <laughs> it's funny because it's true that in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of second and third world countries, you do need connections, right? Even in China, like it's funny when, when I lived there, they had this concept called the Guangxi, it's a Chinese word, and it basically means how well connected you are. So, and they say like someone that doesn't have Guangxi has no chance to really do anything uh, substantial. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how it is in a lot of countries in the world, but it's not like that in North America or Europe, right? Yeah. Anybody can start a business. If you have a good quality product or service, you're going to, you know, you're going to sell. You're gonna, you'll have the chance to, to be successful. No one's going to stop you. Okay. So um, talking about your book, you have absolutely amazing stories in there and, and you're, you're totally right because... Um, there is no clear path to any entrepreneur and to any immigrant to starting their business. Um, you're totally right. You do not need a college degree unless you're in like the medical field or some kind of exactly. like lawyer, attorney field that you, you know, for sure need some sort of license or yeah. a JD diploma. But more often than not, and I don't want to discount education, but more often than not, people really don't need a college education to start their businesses. And like you mentioned, your top employee only has a high school diploma. And that's because he came energetic. He came determined. He came to learn and grab everything to be successful in that particular position. So I want to know, I think from what I heard and read, you had over 500 people that submitted their stories to be in your book. How did you choose? Yeah. How did you choose the 50 out of the 500 or 500 or something that you collected? Well, to be honest, it was um, it was mostly the ones that were the quickest at getting back to me. You know, I was sending like so. I had my assistant Sarah follow up with a lot of these entrepreneurs to set up times to talk or to answer some questions. And a lot of them would take a long time to get back to us, um, mm -hmm. like weeks or months sometimes. So we, for the 50, I really needed 50 entrepreneurs that are going to be able to communicate with me on, on a regu regular basis so that the book can be actually completed in a reasonable amount of time. And even though they were super responsive, it still took two years to get this book done. Uh, no way. Yeah, it took two years because there's just a lot of back and forth for each story, a lot of back and forth, a lot of details missing. And then you hire an editor and then the editor goes over the stories and say, hey, there's this, you know, they, they're talking about this, but then they introduce this event. But what's, there's no logical connection between these two events. So they ask for additional uh, feedback or additional mm -hmm. details from, from each entrepreneur. So then you have to email them back and ask them all these additional questions. And then some of them, you get on the phone with them. Some of them, they reply to you with the right answers. And yeah, there's a lot of back and forth. And same with the publisher. You know, when you send everything to the publisher, it takes a while. Then they get back to you with some issues. Then you have to fix those issues, get back to them. And then it, the whole process is not easy. I thought it would be easy given that the content would be provided by each immigrant. Yeah. But I, I feel like it was harder than actually writing the whole book on your own because you depend on each person to give you the answers. Uh, wow. They know their story. You don't know their story. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had written a book of 290 pages about me, I only have myself, you know, if anything is missing, if the publisher emails me and says, hey, I need this, I'll reply right back. Here, here's what you need. But when you have 50 people and some of them might take a longer time than others to get back to you, you kind of have to wait for all of them to send you all the information 
and then you send it all to the publisher. So the, I, I'd say that that was the main criteria because mm-hmm. out of all the immigrants that I interviewed, and a lot of them, you know, as you said, you found them on Medium or, or Thrive Global. They all have interesting stories for the most part. Yeah, I feel like it just came down to uh, 50 people that were willing to be part of this book project and willing to give me any information that I needed and willing to be responsive. And um, yeah, so that's what it came down to, to be honest. It's not like I chose them based on who I, I liked personally. Yeah. <laughs> it really just, and it, it, what I love about this, Alina, is that somehow I ended up with 50 very diverse stories coming from all continents and 50% men, 50% women. And I swear to God, Alina, I didn't really plan for this to be this way. Wow. I kind of, at the end of the book, I was looking at this. So I was like, oh, let me see, like, how many men do I have? How many women? How many yeah. people from Africa do I have? How many people from South America? And it just was like so well balanced, but magically. So I was amazing. like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is amazing. Because I really It was meant to be. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was meant to be. Wow, amazing. So is this your very first book that you wrote? Yeah, yeah, very first. Yeah. Okay. Any more books coming in the future? Well, um, you know, depending on the success of this one, I'd say, because obviously I spent a lot of money on it and I don't expect that I'd be making it back. Or if I do, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. But it's really just, it was mostly to um, to get the message out there. Yeah. But I'll see if this, if results are good over the next few months and, and years, if I see that people are still interested in the book. Then I have other angles, other angles of entrepreneurship that I'd like to cover. For example, mm-hmm. an angle that I really like is, um, you know, older people. So people above 60 that start a business because a lot of them, you know, especially in my family, when I talk to my mom or whatever, like it's out of the question. Like I'm too old for this. Right. Right. But oftentimes like meet these entrepreneurs and they tell you that they started their business after 60. So I feel like that could make an interesting book. Yeah, and, and and I'm by, by the way, I'm saying it on your podcast because I don't even care if someone takes the idea and does it. I just think yeah. it be done. Yeah. So yeah, I totally love your book, and I've talked about it so many times on my show. So I will link it again in the show notes after our show, so people can grab a hold of it Amazing. And, sh- and share with all their immigrant friends and family members. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's super important for a country like the U.S. or, or Canada or any other developed country to be able to attract talented people or even just like motivated people, passionate people. You know, they don't have to be, even if they aren't talented in their home country, but they want deeply, they badly want to immigrate because they want more opportunity and, and for them and their, and their, for their children. To me, that's, um, I feel like in the future, there's going to be a war on talent because you, you have all these countries that need manpower. You know, mm-hmm. China is growing to be a big country, and I think they're going to be needing a lot of skilled people in the future. So now you got the US, you got Canada, you got, you know, the UK, Australia, all these countries are going to need skilled people. Yeah, I feel like the country that's going to make it the easiest and it's going to give them more opportunities. And by the way, the US is still leading in this space, even though obviously a lot of people move to. Canada, Europe, Australia, entrepreneurs are still more interested in the U.S. because they know that they can make it bigger in the U.S. than any other country, right? So I feel like the U.S. has that advantage, but they must be careful not to lose it. Right. China or any other country. You know, you look at Elon Musk, he was in South Africa, then he moved to Canada, he studied in Canada, but then he moved to the U.S. because he wanted Silicon Valley, right? There's only one Silicon Valley. There's not two of them, there's one. There's only one Hollywood. When someone wants to be an actor, they move to Hollywood, right? There's only one, like the the musical industry, look at the biggest Canadian artists, like Justin Bieber or Drake, they go to the U.S. Like people from the U.K. or Australia, the, the most ambitious people tend to move to the U.S. And that's a major advantage that the U.S. has. If they lose it, I feel like uh, I feel like it'd be like a horrible thing for the country. So yeah, no, yeah. you're totally right. Thank you so much for writing this book. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to Iron Monk Solutions. I want to know, did you have any mentors that helped you out to start your business? Mentors? No, actually, no. No. Okay. And I feel like I, I feel like that was... Uh, a mistake on, um, I feel like that was my mistake. I should have seeked mentors. I feel like that helps your growth tremendously. So I would encourage anyone that gets started to, to seek out a mentor in the beginning. It would take you way less time to succeed than it, than it took me. <laughs> yeah. And what about networking? Do you do any like entrepreneur networking organizations? Are you plugged in anywhere right now? So now I am. But then again, that's also something I should have done in, in year one that I didn't do. 
but now I am. I'm part of Forbes Communication Council and YEC, which is Young Entrepreneur Council. Okay. And also like uh, various other groups that I met online or through Meetup or through like online forums. So now I, I network a lot more than I did in the beginning. In the beginning, I was just, I just believed that I could do everything on my own. I didn't believe that I needed anybody. Mm-hmm. And that was a mistake in a sense that it, everything was so much more complicated and everything took longer. And I made a lot of mistakes that I could have avoided if I networked with the right people. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So networking and, and finding mentors is crucial in an entrepreneur career, right? Yeah. And there's also mm-hmm. that organization. I think it's called Entrepreneur. It's called EO Entrepreneur. Yes. Or, yes. What does it stand for? Yeah. It's Entrepreneur Organization, I believe. Okay. Yeah. What, yeah. And, and, I, and I believe it's like a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars to get in. I don't know about the cost because I just learned about it recently. That's the funny thing. When oh, doing this book, yeah. <laughs> when doing this book, I, I like because I, we, we're part of a WhatsApp group with all the immigrants of the book, right? Yeah. A lot of them started talking about this organization and they would refer to it as EO. So they would say, hey, I'm part of EO Texas. I'm part of EO Seattle. I'm part of EO. And I was like, what's EO, guys? And like, yeah. that's when I learned about it. I didn't even know about it because I like, yeah, like I said, I'm part of other ones. Yeah, this one seems to be quite popular. Yes. Yeah. So I'm on their website right now and member dues, global dues are currently at twenty four seventy, so two thousand four hundred and seventy dollars. So okay. it is kind of pricey. But it, yeah, may it is be, pricey, yeah. Yeah. It might be a business expense if you're making good money up there, right? <laughs> yeah. Forbes Forbes Finance Council uh, Forbes Communication Council is cheaper actually. I think it's like fifteen hundred. And and they allow you to post content on Forbes.com, which is amazing to market your business. Oh, okay. So to me, uh, I would spend the money there before I'd spend it on entrepreneur organization. But then yeah. again, I don't know what EO offers. Maybe they do offer a lot of stuff that Forbes doesn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So moving along. I mean, how do you stay productive throughout the day to ensure that all business things are getting taken care of? How do I stay productive? Yes. Do you have like a to-do list or goal list, monthly, quarterly goals? So we we do have a lot of tools that we use at work to keep track of all the projects. So I know like the status of each project we're working on. One of my favorite tools is called Teamwork, uh, teamwork teamwork.com. Okay. And it just allows you to create projects and assign different people to the project. And and even the client can, can log in and, you know, post messages and upload files and stuff. So yeah, we have these tools. So that helps us stay productive. You know, it's also about... As you know, we're human beings, right? So we have to be in tune with our mind and body and know when we're productive, when we're in a productive phase and when we aren't. So like for me, like for example, sometimes early morning, I feel really productive and I get a lot of work done. But then that production window kind of dies gradually as we get closer to lunchtime. So then what I do is I just forget about work. I do something else, whether it's working out, whether it's going for a walk, whether like it's just watching a program like something on Netflix that that I like, like a mm-hmm. TV show or watching a documentary or watching a sports game. I do something else that doesn't have anything to do with work. And working out is a big one, by the way. And you look at if you look at the book, all of these entrepreneurs work out one way or another. Whether it's yoga, whether it's jogging, running, walking, whatever, they all do something because you can't just be working all day and expect your brain to be sharp nonstop from, you know, for eight hours. That's just not possible. And by the way, even when you're doing nine to five, you're not productive from nine to five, right? Yeah. (laughs) No one ever is, right? No. (laughs) You're going to be wasting a lot of time on social media. You're going to be chatting with your colleagues. You're going to be on the phone. You're going to be... Coffee breaks. Coffee breaks, cigarette breaks, whatever, right? Yeah. So you you might be productive for like three hours, right? (laughs) And you're still... Hopefully (laughs) not. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's not about how many hours. It's really just like how much quality work you can deliver in that time frame. Right. You know, I feel like sometimes in 15 minutes, I produce... I made like those 15 minutes, like made my whole week, you know, like I, they made the whole week worth it. Right. Like Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. even if I did nothing for the rest of the week, those 15 minutes, I wrote a fantastic email that, you know, got me so like the ROI of writing that email is like substantial, right. Or writing an article just in that, in an hour in the morning, right. You write an article that ends up getting you so much coverage or so many clients. So it's not about how many hours I find. It's really just uh, how efficient you are 
during that time that you're working. Got it. Got it. So are there any top marketing tips or maybe one that you can share for a new business that just came into the market? Well, the, the number one really is to build yourself a portfolio of happy clients. You know, whether you sell a product or service, you just have to have positive testimonials if you want to get a paid client to actually pay you, right? To trust you. It's not having thousands of followers on social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, because those guys are not going to pay you. Trust me. <laughs> you know, they might be fans because there's something to get out of it. But, yeah. Um, you know, they're not fans necessarily because they want to buy your product or service. Social media is, um, you know, it's more like an ego thing to be able to say, like, your company has this many followers or this many fans or this many subscribers. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really translate to revenue that well. I've seen companies with 100,000 followers that make less money or less, they have less clients, less revenue than companies with 150 followers. So it really doesn't mean much, you know. It's important still because you still want to be able to uh, to, to, to communicate. And, and when you post something, you want to be able to reach as many people as possible. But as far as getting business goals, I wouldn't really worry about it at all. Amazing. Yeah. And in the world that we live in, it seems like a lot of people are pushing social media. So that's really good to know and good to hear. But then again, it depends on your line of business. Maybe, you know, certain types of business uh some yeah. businesses might benefit more than others, uh, you know, in terms of having uh, a lot of fans and followers. So I don't know. But from my experience, most businesses, most traditional businesses don't really need as many uh, fans and followers as they think they do. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good to know. Thank you. And how do you reinvest in yourself to keep up to date with your market? Well, I mean, you read a lot of, like I said, you know who are the leading companies and, and organizations in your field are. You just have to follow them and keep up with the content that they're posting. To me, that's the number one way. Because if they're successful, if they're leaders, they're there for a reason. So you don't reinvent the wheel. You just have to learn from, from the ones that are very successful at it. So to me, that's the number one way. I just keep, I follow all the top people on Twitter in my field. I follow like, you know, like Google, for example, when they post updates to their search engine. You know, I'm like, I follow them everywhere, like on Twitter, I follow them on their blog and stuff. So anyone, anytime there's an update, I know about it. Yeah, I follow the most successful owners and CEOs of, of the top companies in the space. I read articles, whether it's on uh, Forbes or any other uh, popular network. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of reading. Got it. But um, it's not like I go to, um, I don't go to school. It's not like I'm, I'm buying, you know, I'm, I'm signing up for classes or anything like that. I don't do that at all. But I, I'm not saying it's not, it cannot be useful. Um, it's just for me, I find like there's, a, there's so much information available online. It's just about knowing who to follow and uh, doing it on a consistent, you know, being consistent with it, right? Doing it every day or at least once a week. And it, se it seems so simple, right? But I think it's overlooked in so many different ways where people think that they need to pay thousands of dollars for a program or thousands of dollars for, you know, to to relearn something where where like you're saying you just you don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel if someone is doing it and doing it successfully just follow what they're doing and and follow that path and maybe tweak it in, in one way or another to make it work for you but it's, it's it just sounds so simple but a lot of people overlook that so thank yeah. you so much for sharing that yeah yeah and to me like when you're passionate about it it comes naturally right you want to learn more about it you want to see what's the latest developments if you find it hard uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you're finding it hard to keep up with the trends or it feels like pulling teeth to you like the, <laughs> you know to, to, to read about a, a new development in your industry to me maybe maybe that's a sign that you don't really like it that much because if it's something you really enjoy then it should come naturally you shouldn't be like feel forced, oh, I got to, you know, read about this new tool that came up that can help me in my business. Like it should be natural, um, yeah. you know? So to me, it never really, uh, it's not like when you're at school, right? When you have to take these classes and you don't really like them, but you have no choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some things you would advise the next aspiring immigrant that wants to start their own business? I, I, I talk about it in the book a little bit at the, at the end. But you kind of have to know, like, so if you're really passionate about something, you also have to know to figure out whether or not you can be competitive at it. So, you know, an example is if, you know, you, you're passionate about basketball, but if you're five foot three, then the, the odds are very low that you're going to make it uh, 
to the big leagues, right? So you kind of have to know, and this is like a concept called the hedgehog uh, principle, I think, from a Stanford professor that came up with it. Mm -hmm. His name is, I think, Robert Blank, Robert something. Anyways, he came Mm -hmm. up with this um, concept that there's like three circles. One is something you're passionate about. One is something that drives your economic engine. And one is something you can be really good at. You can be competitive at, right? So you kind of have to find an idea. Like your idea has to ideally fall within these three circles. So it has to be something that you're good at. It has to be something that's economically like, you have to know your economics. You have to know like, like what's the cost? Like you have to know all the data of your your competition. What's going to be the cost to get a client? What kind of profit you can make per sale, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it has to be obviously yeah, something you can be good at. So going back to that example, if you want to play in the NBA, you kind of need certain things to be able to compete. So you might not feel, fall within that circle. You might have two out of three, right? If you're super passionate about it and you're in a city where it's sport is number one sport and everyone is passionate about it. But then if you lack that thing that everybody else has in the top leagues, then you're kind of at a disadvantage right there. So you have to be realistic also. Yeah, so to me, like if you're an immigrant and you do have something you're really passionate about and you're skilled at it and it is in demand and you know your numbers, you know how much profit you can make for, for your sales, you know what who, which competitors you're going against, you're basically able to create a business plan and sell your idea, then to me, it's a no-brainer. You should definitely do it. You really have not, you don't have much to lose. You don't have to like follow that traditional path because your parents are pushing you, you're direct, you know, your peers are saying you have to go to university, you have to get going. Right. In these fields, you don't have to do that. That's not mm-hmm. true. You're in, in a country like the U.S. You can you can do anything. It's really easy to open your business. And by the way, in the book, you'll see that a lot of these entrepreneurs, they started with nothing, no upfront capital, no education, no connections, but you got resources available. And um, one of the entrepreneurs, she's from Afghanistan. I don't know if you read her story, Eva, Eva Hanifi. No, she I'm talks kidding. about how she got upfront capital from a bank. And she had nothing, right? No education whatsoever. Well, she had education from I think back home or perhaps she had education from Germany as well because she had spent some time in Germany. But anyways, the point is she didn't have any up, up, upfront capital. She didn't have any business degree, anything like that. And she was still able to get a substantial amount of capital, I think even a grant to start her business. And a lot of them fall in that category as well. They were able to get some uh, some money without going to investors, just from traditional financial firms. Yeah, you got the resources. So t- why why not give it a try, right? What's yeah. the worst that's going to happen? <laughs> exactly. So much powerful advice. Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I really appreciate your time and such valuable advice. And your journey is going to inspire so many immigrants I know. And I hope to hear more future books in your path and hope to see more good things out of your businesses and wishing you all the best of a life. So thank you so much. Thank you, Alina. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks for thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, we'll, awesome. uh, we'll connect again in the future, I'm sure. All righty, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a review wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.